here. My name is Rachel Berger. I live in South Portland. Um, let's see, I've lived here since 2000. I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction, but Paula already kind of has. Um, yes, I did spend 17 years um, working for and being part of the Transition House Collective that was the second shelter for battered women in the country. It was exciting work. <clears throat> I did a number of other things. I helped to start the Women's Fund. It was kind of my idea. Of course, lots of other very talented people came and made it happen. Um, and yes, I was part of the peace movement. Came to South Portland and started a Green South Portland group. By then, the environment was very much in my mind. It worked quite well. We were just a small collective that uh, met in the library. We got going a project of what I call buttoning up older houses in which we involved friends and volunteers. I did that every Sunday, We'd put on a tool belt and go work with them. And the houses then got improved by other people. I say that because I also then joined the uh, elders of future generations, a little bit like um, Adam, but Adam does it in Cambridge and we do it here. Pre previously, I had been at a huge demonstration around the issue of tar sands, not, not natural gas, tar sands that um, was being dug out in Alberta in Canada. And there was a threat that they would be brought down through South Portland and sent off to the ocean. Actually, um, what happened there was that the woman who was pushing this and who had started this huge demonstration that I also went to, the coldest we ever went to, her name e Emily Figdor from Environment Maine, she had asked that there would be a group in South Portland who would deal with this issue. So there and then I said, I'll do it. For me, it was terribly exciting to have an opportunity like this. Um, uh, James Hansen had said, tar sands, game over. This was extremely critical that we stop this. Um, it still is so. It's very critical that it gets stopped. They are fortunately doing very badly at this point. So anyhow, I said I'd do it. I, when I, on coming home, I called uh, Tom, who had been a, the, the mayor, and he said he had a workshop set up which was going to deal with this. Could I fill the room? Well, I and two other women who were, had been my or were my uh, students doing watercolor, we, we set out to fill that room. And we, we did a pretty good job. And um, about 50 people then stood up and said they were against having tar sand. So it was all, already an impressive um, beginning. I want to see the first slide now, please. There we go. Uh, that is the area that two um, stacks were going to be built, two 70 foot stacks to get rid of the additions that they put in tar sands to make it possible to put them down a pipe. The pipe that was being planned to use was one that had been put in the ground after the Second World War, during the Second World War, and they wanted to reverse it and use it another, in another direction. Um, the city actually had already given them permission to do this um, four years before, and this permit had run out in August. So we had a very, very short time to, to turn this around. So it was a, an exciting and pressing situation. Uh, next slide, please. John, there. That's where, um, just behind where this photo was taken from is where the two stacks would, would have been put up. Next slide, please. Okay, that was the, the meeting, the workshop that we had got um, so many people to go to, uh, in addition to other people like the Sierra Club and Environment Maine and NRCM had also put out word. Uh, 
a long line of people got up to speak against tar sands being allowed. This was also a very exciting moment. It was, but I had no idea how to move forward at this point. Next slide. Um, soon after that, I, um, you can see me over on the right, and other people who I knew and were part of this group, one of them there is, is holding the flag at the other side and she is no longer with us, she died. Um, we went every Sunday and held this up and cars would go by and poop and uh, you know poop their horns and obviously show that they were with us and it was very exciting to do that. This was just a very little token thing of saying we're here and we oppose this. Next slide please. This is the first, okay, what happened then was that I had basically got on the phone, called all the people from Green South Pole and called anyone else and asked anyone if they knew anyone to join in starting a group. And you see some of those people at our first press conference there. Um, at our very first meeting, we had somebody from Toxic Action and she said what we had to do was focus on the, the council. I'd never dreamt of doing this. I'd not been at a council meeting before. She said, go through all those people, find out who they are and whether they're going to be with us. We did that and found that only two were progressive and the other were all relatively conservative. So we had our work cut out. She said, you need to go around the, the whole, you need to go to places where many people meet and get, collect signatures. So we did that. We did that for some time. We found about 75% of the people were with us at that point. Next slide. That again is, the, is this uh, press conference we did. Move on. Okay, now we're moving into a different gear. One of the people in our group, and this took of course some time, was a, an impressive lawyer. And she put together an ordinance to forbid tar sands in our city. Um, here you see a group of, of our group, some of them, the ones that didn't want to go door to door, um, do co doing collating for the people that were going to go door to door. Next. Oh, and at this point we were adding up how many doors we'd been to. Next. Other people helped us. Here we have a group from Hampshire College who helped us, which is very nice. Move on. Next. We're going to have a few of the meetings, uh, slides now of busyness of our campaign, everybody calling people. Basically, what had happened is we needed to get this up for election for, for um, uh, and we only had 19 days to get this ready and we had four, oh, nearly 4,000 people who are already with us. Next. Because we had this little attempt of hands across the bridge, we decided that before the election, you see everybody's got these four t-shirts on, that means vote for, we would have a hands across the bridge. Next. And we'd include our whole group. So there you see how many, how big our group had become. Next. And next. A few more slides of the activity before on the last day of the vote. It was very tense. Move on. Um, Taryn Hallweaver helped us. She had been an organizer for Obama. Move on, please. We lost. We lost by um, 193 votes. We put all this effort into it and we lost. What the woman there speaking is, she'd never spoken before. She said, we haven't lost. We've still got most of the city with us. And it really was so that we did because the other side, the pipeline, had put a tremendous lot of money into working against us. They had lied. They'd said they were never going to bring tar sands here. They had told people to vote the other way so that it would confuse the audience and done things like that. 
every person that voted on their side, they had spent uh, $35 on. Next. There is our cake, thanking us for what we've done. Next. Now I don't know what this is. Oh yes. Then we started having big meetings. You see that group at the back? That is the line of people that are ready to speak at our next meeting. What happened at the moment that we lost was this so-called some conservative council said, well, if most of the city is with them, we have to do something. And they decided to do a moratorium that would basically stop anything from happening. In that pause, they elected three very appropriate people to write a defendable ordinance, which is what happened. And there we are supporting what the council had done. Next. We had a number of people, this young man, actually had taken Tarsans on for his bar mitzvah, so he was with us totally, and he spoke at every meeting. Next. Here's the oldest person that spoke. She would come from a nursing home. She had been an activist and still was one. She also spoke in favor of not allowing Tarsans to come through South Portland. Next. Uh, a number of months later, the little committee that was going to put together this, the new ordinance, which they called Clear Skies, um, is, is explaining what they did and what their rationale was. Next. There I am with my, with my adopted daughter. What, the reason we're wearing the Clear Skies is both to celebrate that we now had a new ordinance, but also to make clear who was on our side and who was against us. There was a reason for this. It was because at one of the meetings in the much smaller council room, so we went in and suddenly the place was filled with workers that had been paid to come up here from Massachusetts to uh, make it impossible for us to have a meeting with the council. So from then on, we had to take very large rooms and make clear who we were and how many we were. Next at some of our group. What happened with our group was that we had this collective that kept on moving things forward. That was the steering committee. Here you see some of them. This group continues to meet with slight difference in who's in the group. Next. Here we have, you can see how many people were against us and how many were for. We're meeting now in the largest room the city had. Next. This is the last meeting. Uh, the kids were lining up basically to say that we were in favor of clear skies and would the council vote with us? So here's one of the, the, actually the children were lining up to get lifted up to the loudspeaker. They wanted to be part of the process. Move on. Last kid. We won. The council voted for us just six four and one against and this is the moment of triumph when we knew we had achieved what we wanted to we had moved the council in our favor to stop tar sands from coming down to south portland next i think this is the last picture it was a very exciting and happy moment we would managed a lot and we were very pleased next no you can leave it there um, after this, we realized that we had a tremendous lot of people with us. What else could we do with all this energy? In previous times, we'd thought about stopping the use of pesticides. So that's what we moved forward with. We also had a mechanism of doing things. If something was very important, we'd bring it to the council. We would also use other methods like LTEs and, and meetings to educate the public. At that point, we got in touch with uh, Beyond Pesticides, which is a group I would highly recommend to anyone else wanting to do this in a city or a uh, college or whatever. They were terribly helpful. They came and spoke to the council and eventually, after a lot of work, a new ordinance forbidding the use of pesticides 
was written in our city and implemented. I don't have it with me, but I, I did a calendar which advised everybody every month what to do that was written. My paintings were on, but a one of our members wrote instructions as to and helpful hints and quotes and so on. And that was printed twice <clears throat> and and given away by the city. We're, we're now doing another ordinance to end the use of chemical fertilizer. Um, we also, in between all this, we've got things thrown at us. One was stopping a propane tank that was too big and dangerous. We, we succeeded in doing that. And presently, we're working to, to lower the quantity of um, throughput that is going on in one of the tank farms. The South Poland has 120 tanks, all holding different forms of petroleum, but not tar sands. So that's what we're doing now. That's kind of the end of what I wanted to say. What time do we have? Oh, just right time. Um, Rachel, that was that was perfect. I mean, this is what blessed unrest looks like, and um, and thank you. I have that book. It impressed me greatly when I yes. read it. Yes. It was just keep going. Great. So, Iona. Okay, Rachel, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my uh, my talk is quite a bit different. And I see this big thing across my, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I was laughing a minute ago, but last, yesterday morning, my heart was broken and I ended up sobbing. I don't cry easily. You could call me Pollyanna in many cases. I have only sobbed when my husband died in August, but one of my new board members, shared a link to planetofthehumans.com. It's Michael Moore's new movie. And I want to show you the website. Planetofthehumans.com. I felt betrayed. I've been in this movement for 54 years. I have supported many of the major environmental groups. I have loved their works. I have been a cheerleader. I have talked about them, written about them. And Michael Moore shows how corporations have essentially bought them. But the reason I ended up crying so, so hard was the very end where a baby orangutan dies a brutal death after the trees he was raised in with his mother and his sibling was was logged it it was i still guess i'm upset about it so i have a short thing to say about my newspaper i'm taking a little bit of a break right now and i'm coming back with a new focus of africa for the past five years, I've had a partner in Nigeria who has, over time, showed me how different their lives are over there. And I networked with a man who started Team 54 Project International, which started with 54 African countries, and it now spreads around the world to over 200,000 members in 169 countries. So my network has gotten a lot bigger with a lot of wonderful young African people uh, sharing their projects. Their projects fit very, very well with biodiversity for a livable climate because they're very much into raising food and caring for their communities and orphans also. So I am in love with Africa right now. And when I come back um, with my newspaper, I'm going to be putting in as many of their stories as I possibly can. 
Now, Adam mentioned the Go Back Club, and yes, I believe that was my role in life. I've thought it for many years that we Americans live way, way, way too, too hard, too seriously, burn too much fuel, have too much stuff. So I've tried to live very simply myself. And when I started getting a lot of African readers, I think half of my subscriber base is now composed of Africans. I thought, gee, they don't have to go back. We have to go back. So I stopped the Go Back Club. But after watching Michael Moore's movie yesterday, I think we need to go back. I might reinstitute the Go Back Club. I'm not sure yet. My first board meeting is going to be May Day. And we will be discussing this because I've got to work harder. I've got to stay alive longer. I've got to be healthier. I'm not quitting. I can't. I can't. So I see I have 10 minutes. What does it say? Savior. Oh, that's my computer. Sorry. Um, anyhow, one thing I did want to say is that the man who showed me the link to Michael Moore's video is named Kennedy McBrien. He is from Nigeria, but he has an office in the United Kingdom and he runs something called the Nexus Exchange, working with a lot of young people. And he, I told him I was doing this workshop and I was going to mention the film. And he has a message for everybody who's listening to me. Please give our love to blessed unrest and let them know they are not alone. We are all in. So that's the kind of relationship I'm developing with my friends in Africa although I've only met two of them in person, but the rest I've, I've networked with extensively. So in thinking about going back, I wore my special dress today. I've been concerned about climate change for about 25 years. My, even my dad knew about it a uh, long ago. So this, this is not new to me and I have, had, I had a wonderful 30-year marriage with a, a, an extremely amazing social peace environmental activist. I call him a hero, a warrior of the movement. So for 30 years, we did our work together, and now I'm doing it alone. And about 25 years ago, I wanted to make a new dress. I, I don't like clothes. I don't like shopping, but I thought I better get a dress. So I had a Kenmore sewing machine, which died on me. And then I found a used treadle machine, but I couldn't figure out how to get it to work. So I got out my needle and thread. This is a sample, a needle and thread. And I'm, I'm going to back up and show you my dress. Well, at least you can see, you can see part of it. Every single stitch is hand done and maybe I show you my the hem I don't know if you can see I don't know where my camp uh oh I don't want to show you my slip uh never mind we'll skip that <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of old-fashioned and modest so anyhow my message right now is twofold one watch the movie planet of the humans have your hanky a real hanky if you can, I like to use cloth hankies and not paper tissues. So have a hanky ready because the end is extremely sad, extremely sad. And yes, Adam, you were right. I would love to have more people on my email list. My, uh, you can you look at my website. It's groundswellnews.org and there's a place to contact me there. And I think we're sort of running out of time. I've delivered the heart of my message, and I think we need to have some time for questions and answers. Okay. Thank you, Iona. You're welcome. Um, there actually, you've got um, another five minutes or so. Okay, could, then, could then you, we'll do, oh, what did you want to say? Well, I would like to hear 
more about your life as an activist. Okay. Your personal. Okay. Um, I started when my first son was born. We we ended up with uh, first of all, I wanted to nurse him and have rooming in back then that was unheard of. I wanted to see him being born and nobody was doing that back then. We, most women were just knocked out. And then as he grew older and I had a second son, we had a home on the, on the Matitaconk River here in New Jersey. And I was pulling weeds furiously because my husband wanted to spray pesticide. And I said, you can't do that our sons are gonna swim in the water and it'll be contaminated. So I started a recycling program back then and I was editing a lot of other newspapers for other groups like the Sierra Club and then there was a, a group of youths in universities who had formed an organization and I was doing all this volunteer work and then I, I not only was a nurse but I was a first grade teacher and in time, I was loving my environmental work more than either of those professions. And I had started the Hackensack River Coalition when I moved up to Secaucus, and I was pretty horrified about the state of that river compared to the river I had been living on, which was clean and safe to swim in and eat from. And then I went to Rutgers and took public health and environmental law, which was only a summer course, but I became an air pollution inspector. So that got me into the factories i wrote 90 violations in 11 months we had a boss who was a tiger he wanted us to write every single violation we found and they don't do that anymore you don't see enforcement anymore so that led me to think i'm at the wrong end of the deal i'm I've, the the pollution has, has happened the people are sick the water is contaminated the sky is polluted so I went to the New Jersey DEP, and then I worked in the Hazardous Waste Division on the Superfund projects in their Community Relations Department. And I had a boss who had just made a slideshow of hazardous waste sites, and she understood, as I did, the, the role we play in creating hazardous waste by all the products we buy. We don't understand what goes into making them. And actually, Michael Moore's film has a good bit of the total destruction of the earth for the stuff we're buying. Then I met John, whom I married, and we were actively involved in churches and school and uh, universities for several years. And I have this passion for writing, but at this point, I'd rather edit and publish other people's stories, especially the young people. So I've been in protests. I've never been arrested, although I used to want to be arrested, but I haven't been. I've just been sort of at protests with my paper and pencil and writing notes and publishing other stories of people who probably have a lot more courage than I do. So here I am um, living alone close to my family, close to the ocean, and be, making a much stronger board. We've had a nonprofit for 30 years, and um, um, I've got a couple of people who are Africans on my board, and we're having <clears throat> uh, our first meeting, as I said, May, May 1st. So my continuing activism is really publishing a stories about other activists. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Iona. You're welcome. Um, so we have the Blessed Unrest Sisters here, and we have um, uh, 15 minutes for Q&A, and then, of course, uh, they'll be giving a workshop afterwards. Oh, we will? Uh, <laughs> oh, won't you? I don't know. I, I don't know. Are we? Sure. Do you want to? <laughs> what are you, Rachel? Sure, I'll do anything. <laughs> okay. So, how so, does that work? so you'll have a you'll have a workshop. When? One thirty. Oh, okay, fine. Thanks. And John Minkle will will put uh, people in their uh, selected 
breakout rooms. So you get Sven, Precious, or Rachel and Iona. It's up to you. Okay, thanks. So do we have do we have questions for Iona um, and or Rachel? I'm trying to read this chat. Uh, Precious has a question. Uh, whoops. I'm having trouble scrolling here. I don't see where to read. Oh. Um, I just had it in front of me and it ran away. I'll find it. Wow, there are some very good uh, comments here. I see it. Yeah. It says, Rachel and Iona, what did you do when things got dangerous in your fields, or did they? Um, the most dangerous it got was when all those men came up from Massachusetts and took our place in the relatively small um, city council room. And just the thing that went through my head was this is the time for nonviolence. We all became very quiet, very controlled, we went to the counselors and they said the meeting is over. Um, so it, it worked out well, but it was a scary moment. For me, I had a job once working for PETA and the first day on the job, we all got into vans and we carpooled over to the Capitol building on a cold January day where Republicans were using real elephants in the cold because they were their symbol. And we were in a, in a section that was blocked off with yellow tape. And I walked to the edge of the yellow tape and stared down at the policeman. Now, that was about the most direct, uh, directly dangerous thing I ever did. My most dangerous job was as an air pollution inspector in the factories where I was just exposed to a lot of chemicals. But all in all, I've been pretty safe, thank God, <laughs> or thank goddess or whatever, thank anybody. I have an additional answer and that is that the work of working in a shelter of battered women is dangerous work. We just had to be very careful, very conscientious. Um, over the phone guide women in such ways that they would not get hurt. Like, I need to go to the store to get some cigarettes. And then of course she never comes back. Um, we, we had decided we would never go actually to rescue a woman from her home because uh, one of our members had tried to do that and got raped in the process. Uh -huh. um, so, so basically, we just had to be very careful in what we did, but also not hold back. And then we would meet p women in a safe place, and we would not disclose where the shelter was. May I take a minute to comment on some of these chats that I'm just seeing now? Please do. Um, I see... Wait a minute, I'm still on Sven here. Rachel, Rachel, did you see this? You are so inspiring. No, I don't know how to see this, the chats. <laughs> how do I do this? Well, um, somebody, maybe John can tell her how to do it, but I, I have them here. Uh, Rachel, if you yes. move your mouse to the bottom of your screen, you'll see uh, a whole bunch of tools pop up in the bottom. One of them says chat. Just press that chat button and it'll show up. Karen's going to help me. Well, right. I, there, there, thank you, thank okay, you. So Precious, yeah. you have to scroll up a little because now they're kind of hidden. Cynthia says, thank you, great story we can use as an example for our own community work. Ralph says, well done, Rachel, thanks. Christine says, yes, just saw it. Michael Moore produced it. The director writer is Jeff Gibbs. That's true. Precious says, Rachel and I own a, what, do, oh, here's the dangerous question. Um, I'm not so gifted at this. Ah, sorry, folks. There's a question here, Rachel, um, from the Eric. Can you tell us how the battle to end chemical fertilizers is going? And what does your ordinance propose? 
Um, this is an interesting question. Um, I did start this whole issue. I managed to get myself into the uh, committee that is planning how to do what to write in the uh, ordinance. And it's quite difficult because for some reason, uh, it's full of people who have looked after land in the conventional way using chemical fertilizer and, and other toxic things. So it's quite an uphill struggle. Um, another person from our group is there and from time to time I write in and say, yeah, but you can't write that chemical fertilizer is good for the soil. It's harmful for the soil. So last time um, they finally mm -hmm. agreed with that. It's an uphill struggle. It's difficult. But the uh, chairwoman who is actually the sustainability um, organizer of the city actually subject to the group that I was in before, because they then had a, a city group that dealt with sustainability. Um, she is with me, but she's, it's taking very long and it's hard. And I'm tr trying to relax and keep moving forward and saying what I think is right. I'm also trying to get help from Beyond Pesticides. They're very helpful. And when I get desperate, I go back and read Judith, Judith Schwartz's book, which I just love. It, it's about land care. Uh, wh which one? Cow Save the Planet? No. Or no, Water in Plain it's Sight? Ca it's Cow Save the Planet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That one, yeah. 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 And I need to read the water one because, of course, it's all hooked together. The reason that it got taken up was because... We have an organization in our city called Friends of Casco Bay, and they were seeing the harm that was happening to the ocean because of the uh, chemical fertilizer going in. So they don't want, they're another form of extreme. They don't even want us to use um, a compost. Um, they want us to stop putting anything on the ground at all. So anyhow, it's things like that we have to battle through. Um, Howard made a good comment here. Please be aware that that film has evoked some strong negative reactions among some important environmentalists too, which I just saw yesterday and have not yet examined closely enough to comment on. That's true. They were uh, exposing like Bill McKibben, Al Gore, Van Jones, uh, people I've always trusted. And then Christine says the film lifts the veils anything with profit and money and power is up for corruption. That's true. Good one, Christine. My website. Here's another one. Christine says, of deep concern is the disposal of solar and wind farms. The resources that go into that and are then disposed of. The point of the whole film is we need to use less. Yeah, that's like my go back club. And also it's, it showed how solar and wind farms just deteriorate over time. They fall apart. They're not useful for that long. And one of the most vivid um, scenes was the large, the first and largest wind farm, I forgot what state it was in, in a desert. And the people seeing the Joshua trees bulldozed over so they could flatten the land to put the wind farm there. And then 20, 25 years later, the wind farm is covered with sand. Hmm. It doesn't do any good anyway. So, so it questions not only the power of money and politics, but also where are we going with all the solar and wind? And I don't know. It just really makes me think uh, much more seriously about what I'm going to be able to do with my newspaper and my group of friends. Mm -hmm. Here's one, Rachel. Here's one. Oh, no, we got that one. Uh, Iona? Yeah. Apropos of what you just said, I, I think the coronavirus is giving us uh, a, another view of how important going back is. You're right. How, how important local and sustainable are in a small as beautiful sense. Exactly. Because this, the size, the globalization, the kinds of connections that are that violate boundaries in the natural world are just suicide 
for humans. Yes. And one thing I love about what the coronavirus has done is it has made us united internationally. We're, we're all trying to help each other, which is what we need to do for the earth. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Seems to me we, we all need to start gardens and start new traditions in cities. Also take care of the insects and plant, plant wildflowers for the insects and get used to some wildness around us. And what I probably have to do is try and collect more people in the city. This is apropos of what was going on in Africa and talk to them about changing what we do and become a presence. One of the interesting things that's happened in South Portland is South Portland now has a reputation of being very progressive and we all just turn to each other and smile. It's because of what we've done. But there's no end to what we still could do. Steve Weinberg okay. just put uh, an interesting post in the chat. Uh, he says, to get done one of your campaigns, how long of a time frame do you consider in doing your work? And I would just interject here that whatever the time frames used to be, they're changing. Everything's happening so much faster. But, but go ahead, Rachel and Iona. Well, the, the whole Talsans venture, which was a big thing, we were opposing a huge amount of money and strength from the oil companies that were all banding together against us. It is, remember, the only place that tar sands have been stopped. Um, the Keystone struggle is still going on and I hope it's failing. I, it, it looks as though it might be failing. Um, other things have taken less time. I mean, we, we, in a way, we found a formula. And the other thing is because of clear skies, which is a referendum and not, was never voted on in our favor, we now have to make sure our council is always progressive. So some of us make it our business to make sure the council is progressive. I involve children and all kinds of people to, to go door to door to make sure it stays progressive. So we're, we're kind of a militant group and people say that um, South Portland, that protects South Portland is the strongest group in the city. And all we are is in a, a few retired women meeting once a week. That's all you are? So, you well, know- Well, we're that, and then we're all, <laughs> all the people that love us. Um, <laughs> so you remember Lois Gibbs and Love Canal and all of that. Yes. yes. Well, when, when the campaign started, she went around to households getting information from people on who was negatively affected by all these all, all these toxic chemicals and yeah we're doing and, that too and the scientists said oh well that's just housewife research so you know yes. this, this is what we I, get i only need to talk to talk some more about how how I, i'm sure I, iona can help us with with what we're doing at the moment with trump saying um, the oil companies, EPA doesn't have to do any rulings anymore. It's given the oil companies permission to just do the hell what they want, break all their laws. And the, the company we're dealing with at the moment, Global, they are planning to quadruple the amount of throughput. So that's our present struggle. I want to continue reading a good comment from Howard here. Where do we go without all the solar? Uh oh, so wait a minute, I got it moved. Sorry. Well, the crux of it is he mentioned population, and that's something that, yeah, the most basic issues are the size and continued growth of the human population and the consumption of resources that people need or think they need. Both of those must be addressed. I forgot to tell you my motto use it up, wear it out make it do or do without nice i like it yeah that's good for americans right mm -hmm. right and it's it's in the groundswell news yep that's our motto <laughs> thank you adam <laughs> i i think i think the 
the comment about um, population is right on target. And when we had our first conference in 2014, it was at Tufts, and, and Tufts' um, a mascot is an elephant. And we were thinking that we'd have an inflatable elephant on the stage, and it would say population on it. Oh. And that, that would have been the elephant in the room. <laughs> and we didn't, we never did it. And we've never really had a focus on population. There are some great organizations that are focusing on it. And birth rates are going way down. And, um, but it, but it's, a po it's a problem because whenever you have more people, you, you use up more resources. And there's no way around it. We don't have to use it up as fast as we're using it up now, but we do have to use it up. So the, the question is, how do we get all of that under control? And I think uh, nature has the answer to that. There, there's a, a, a fellow named Alfred Crosby who wrote a book called Ecological Imperialism, uh, Europe from 900 to 1900. And in it, he says, nature always takes care of populations out of control hmm. and her ministrations are never gentle. <laughs> and hmm. we, are, we are living that real time right now. Absolutely. I just want to stop for a second and answer my son's question. I kind of have already, but yes, Niels, we stay in touch with all the counselors. We, when somebody is running for office, we ask them if they're going to protect the clear skies and if they care about people and we continue to stay in touch with them. If we have a big issue, we always send our letters to the counselors. I hope that answers it. Have a good day, sweetie. There you go. So not only are we an online conference, we are a communications network for you and your children. Thank you. <laughs> not that you don't have other such networks. Well, so and the, my other son is, putting on a huge puppet shows that always deal with a conflict between people and nature and ways to end that. And they're wonderful and gorgeous and big, but this year he can't do it. Can he do it online? We'd be happy um, to help I'll him. I'll ask him. I'll yeah, ask he, can, him. he can call me if he wants to talk about it. It's generally done works. in a very big amphitheater and yep. the whole, and people, are close to each other, so he'd have yeah. to be very creative. <laughs> well, that's which he can be. He is very creative. Yeah, I'll bet he is. And he, and he I works think... with um, David Solnit with all the graphics that are oh. all over the country. Great, Rachel. Why don't you give people the name of the uh, and and the link to his puppet company? Oh. Yeah, if you could um, type type that into the chat, that would be a good place. I'll do that. I'll do that. 